coconut. Recording from some unknown location off world where Picard is trying to find us. This is Politrex. The time the Declaration of Human Rights, the United Federation of Planets, the United Nations, World War II, the Dominion Federation War, the Art of War, the Teachings of Sirach, Jesus Christ, Calus, the Unforgettable. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Polytrex. Uh, Parry Deford usually does this part, which is clearly how you can tell I'm not uh, the best at it. My name is Shashank Kavaru. Not joining me today is my co-host Barry Deford. If you want more info, I have talked about what's going on with him. You can definitely see him on his social media. He has a lot of things going on in his life and I'm there for him. I love him. I cannot wait to see him back on the show. But in the meanwhile, I do have an exciting guest that you'll hear in this episode. That person is full of insightful, smart thoughts and awesome jokes. So just delightful all around. But I did, did want to tell you that we are a Trek Geeks show. We're part of the Trek Geeks network. The Trek Geeks is an awesome, awesome network uh, full of creative people that allow us to be weird and funny and crazy. Uh, we have a lot of uh, fun shows that you can listen to on Trek Geeks. You can uh, see what they are and uh, explore more about them on the Trek Geeks network at uh, trekgeeks.com. So much good stuff that you can find on there. We are just so lucky to be a small part of that big network. And later in the show, you will listen to our wonderful sponsor, uh, Fansets. Uh, the, you will listen to their discount code that we have for the for our podcast. Be sure to keep listening to that and use that discount code. Uh, Fansets is an awesome sponsor and we are so lucky to have them. But anyway, on to the episode uh, 29, which is our review slash analysis of Maps and Legends. Hey everyone, welcome back to another exciting episode of Engaging with Star Trek Picard. Uh, this has been a fun series for us to do so far, episode one. I hear, uh, I've gotten a lot of good feedback, so thank you for listening. I, I appreciate that so much. There are so many reviews out there. I feel like if you, can just, if you just type Star Trek Picard, you'll find so many reviews from so many people, which is a good thing. I hope all of these people are spreading good, positive Star Trek vibes in the world, and for those who are not, that's fine too. We'll we'll deal with you. Uh, not in a threatening way. We will deal with you and we will live with it uh, because that's part of uh, the IDIC lifestyle. Hey, uh, today we'll be doing a review slash analysis of uh, Maps and Legends, episode two of Star Trek Picard. And I have a special guest. Hopefully I can snag her for as many as she'll be able to do with me. It's... Uh, the wonderful Ali Martinez, uh, D Trekkie on Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, she is, you can find her online doing some of the best cosplay and saying some of the nicest, smartest things about Star Trek. Anyway, without further ado, here's Ali Martinez. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on. I'm super excited we were able to make this work. Japan is, I mean, crazy, like 15, 16 hours ahead with the time difference. So I'm I'm very grateful. Shashank woke up very early to talk to me. So I'm very grateful for that. Hey, so what did you think of this episode, Ali? Maps and Legends? Yeah, I really, really liked it. I Not that I didn't like uh, Remembrance, because I did. It was incredible. But I think that the momentum that Picard is building is really just not getting into my head, but I just want more. Every single week I want more and we get it every week. How exciting is that? So I actually think I enjoyed this episode a little bit more than Remembrance. I think it opened up the world a little bit more. I think it gave us a little bit more information and still kept us asking questions. So Very nice. I like that. It's, uh, it's not the same as Remembrance was. Remembrance has a bit more action. Mm -hmm. And they're, entering, they're putting you in the world in Remembrance. And this, they're starting to show the all the threads that connect to the larger plot. 
what i find interesting i saw the ready room if you guys aren't seeing the ready room here on the in the us you can see the ready room with will wheaton on youtube oh ali i'm so sorry but in Crying. the ready room they had akiva goldsman for this episode and he said you know really the first three episodes are the pilot so i think that's how it's going to go i think the next episode is going to be showing us how he gets gets a ship and then mm-hmm. who is going to be on that ship and what they're going to do Uh, so well we kind of know what they're going to do but uh, that's that's where we are and uh, i enjoyed this episode as well i liked it a lot i didn't love it uh, as much as remembrance i think remembrance to me i i don't know if there is a i said this last time i don't know if there is a stronger pilot episode for a star trek show yeah i remember you saying that And do you would you agree what do you think oh i think that part of what makes this pilot so exciting for me is that i had a bunch of people over when i had to when i got to watch it i had a watch party with a bunch of people that had never ever seen star trek before and so i done that with discovery but it was after it had premiered and i had seen it once already so now it was kind of like fresh eyes from everyone i i think it is a really strong pilot i say the one that would like i think come up against it the most would maybe be caretaker mm-hmm. i think also for me broken bow is really special but that's like a family thing for me i don't mm-hmm. necessarily think that's the strongest like pilot episodes but it's like nostalgic i suppose so yeah i would say i agree with you okay awesome uh so what we'll do today we'll just go scene by scene talk about the episode and uh, i'll share with you some interesting things there is a lot of historical espionage in the show with the jacques bash so i'll share with you some things about the freemasons and some historical espionage from my subcontinent of india and take you back and tell you about some fascinating characters from them okay so scene b1 is the in my favorite scene uh, it's the destruction of utopia planitia mm-hmm. and uh, you see f8 being shown on first contact day they zoom into mars on contact day that was pretty cool i thought uh, it's almost like they're dropping you from the sky into uh, utopia planitia isn't it interesting that a place called utopia got destroyed it uh, that that kind of like a, yeah <laughs> just had a weird feel to me i was like it's called utopia you guys but you see uh, you see them being called plastic people when like even doctor mm-hmm. or mr pinkus when he sees them he's like hello plastic people like uh in blade runner they call them skin jobs oh yeah uh, mm-hmm. uh similarly they call them skinners and it's very close to like the end, like it's supposed to uh provoke them and it's kind of offensive mm-hmm. the, and they're doing it but when even the lady who does it she does it she calls him all those things and she says oh yeah they're not supposed to feel things yeah you think there'd be like some utopia planitia hr sitting there like yo guys <laughs> this shouldn't be happening <laughs> or we don't want it to happen in my in my mind of course i would be that hr representative i'd be like oh don't do that you can't call them that <laughs> which is so strange because you don't you it's weird that even like a few hundred years from now people mm-hmm. will continue to use uh like terms that might be considered offensive yeah kind of that is pretty sad and the fact that they're getting joy out of it is even weirder uh but hey that's that's where we are but anyway i wanted to tell you a little bit about the guy who plays f8 do you know anything about him i don't but i know that you know <laughs> <laughs> because i looked it up i was hoping uh, that by some miracle i could find him and uh, hopefully he could come on the show because i liked his performance a lot mm-hmm. uh, he his name is alex beel and he's an actor and yoga teacher oh and he created an app also it's called i think yoga on the go or something but he's big into yoga you can check out his uh, instagram i think it's like the alex baylor i'm alex bail but it's alex bail b i e h l i'm sure if you google it you'll find it but he's 27 so that wow. kid is really young uh, and it was he he's like apparently he was at stlv before for real what yeah he somebody wrote on like a comment or something they're like hey i remember seeing you in stlv cosplaying it's awesome that this happened for you so it's uh it's a strange how it all came together but 
that that was just something I wanted to share with you. So correct me if I'm wrong. F8 is like B4, right? That's what they want. Yeah, I suppose that like connotation that goes along with it. My husband even picked that out right away. He was like, oh, F8, like fate. Ha! I was so proud of him. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I thought, I think originally B4 was supposed to be B9. Oh. Like B9. Really? And then they changed, yeah, and then they changed to B4. Uh, these are random things that I know about. Why do I know that? <laughs> <laughs> For uh, podcasting, but, that's why. Yes, uh, but the nomenclature of a letter hyphen a number continues. So that was pretty cool, I thought. Uh, anyway, so what, what else did you like about that scene? I like the weapon he used. It was really, really interesting. I also really liked when you were talking about earlier about, hey, why are they talking to people like that? Wouldn't you think in the future that we'd be like past that? Mm -hmm. And even when that one, the, the one worker speaks up and says like, hey, like, you know, he can hear you, right? And yet they don't even care. And then they just carry on with their conversation like he's not even there. And it makes me think like, yeah, synths would do like what they would be programmed to do. But also, shouldn't you still be concerned about like their performance? Because like uh, with Data... Yeah, they trusted him implicitly on the Enterprise, but they still, like, watched him. It wasn't like it was just he could autonomous, like, just do everything. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting that there wasn't so much, like, super... Not, I don't want to say supervision isn't the right word, but, like, oversight, I suppose. It seemed yeah. like they were very self-sufficient in that way. Now, the Enterprise is considered one of the best ships, so that's maybe true. that's not the the example to take here but on the enterprise nobody ever called him like hey you like an offensive word that yeah. you think for somebody like him like hey you machine or something like that the closest was bruce maddox but then he became friends with him yeah but we or know like that pulaski didn't. too with like data's a machine he can't do that he can't win or feel mm -hmm. that's i guess would be the closest yes. explanation to it when he got activated f8 like I saw that in his eyes, something like flickered and that's how he got activated. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to me that it happened on first contact day. Yeah. So is the implication that this was the Jacques Vosh? I suppose that's what we would take away from it. But it would it have been, it must have been planned for that day specifically. Yeah, almost like an irony. Like, yeah. hey, you know how uh, like uh, people try to do things during big national events like the Boston Marathon when that was mm -hmm. happening or just uh, like doing specific things on like holidays mm -hmm. or uh, just to like make a point. Yeah, and to like that, rub it in the Federation's face. I thought that was pretty much in line uh, and it spoke back to our events today. Do you know the Star Trek Picard podcast? I feel like I've heard of it before. So Deadline, the magazine, yes. is doing, is doing yeah. what is called the official Star Trek Picard podcast. Mm -hmm. And they're doing 30 minutes in which they have like Alex Kurtzman. The first episode, Patrick Stewart was there. And they were talking about how everything is supposed to evoke uh, things from your life right now. Oh, and well, yeah, it does. The, <laughs> the since ban is kind of like uh, the Muslim ban mm -hmm. or... Uh, the refugee ban or the border wall. And that those are the things they talk about. They're like, that's what they're supposed to evoke. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And anyway, so we'll move on to the next scene before we just talk about that scene for the rest <laughs> of the day. As much as I would like to just do an entire episode on that scene. Uh, we then move on to uh, Jaban and Laris and they're talking to Picard. And he is just breaking down what he found out so far. And then Jaban and Laris talk about the Jacques Bosch, which is actually what they think is really behind all this, not the Tal Shiar, who yeah. technically would be behind all this. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that? Uh, so they give us some exposition about what they are. They're like, J -J the Jacques Vash is supposed to stand for the dead because yeah. they're really the only reliable keepers of secrets. What do you think of the Jacques Vash in general? Uh, give us your thoughts. I thought it was really fascinating. I can find sometimes in other shows where they just will present a term at you or present something and then there's like no background and then you're like wait a minute what is going on i have no idea what's happening but i like yeah <laughs> that's a good example but i found in this that it gave me just enough exposition that i was still asking questions but it didn't overdo it 
where I was like, okay, well, now I already know the answer to everything. Because there are other, like, times where shows will provide too much exposition, and before that's even done, you already know what's going to happen. So I like that there was, like, that just, just enough. But then also, like, I'm completely in love with Laris, so um, let's be real here. <laughs> I, li- I like Gladys's sassiness. Yes. She's very, very sassy. She she reminds me, not reminds me, but I really, really like that that like feistiness is something that I find a lot from Ensign Row. And so seeing it a little bit like a different side of the spectrum with Laris, but still very, very like close to my heart. She's so like sassy and feisty, and that's everything that I feel like Picard needs to like to balance out his like cool collective, okay, what's next? And she's just like, hey, yo, what is going on here? In her like awesome Irish accent, which everyone is mad at apparently on the internet right now, which is crazy. Everyone's saying, why can how does a Romulan have an Irish accent and all this crazy stuff, which is way, way too bad. I guess aliens can't have accents now. Wow. Okay. All right, people on the internet. Yeah. Uh, Come on. Let's, yeah. It's 2020. Let's. Do they let's... know? Did they know this is a sci-fi show? And yeah. It's, it's set in a future that most of us will not live to see in any way. But okay. All right. Hey. Uh, sorry, people are mad, but I do want to ask you: Have you read uh, Star Trek: Picard? Calm down. I haven't. I've been meaning to, and I've been hearing you podcast about it and talk about it, and I've been meaning to get it because I can't get the physical books here in Japan, but I could get it on Comixology. So I've been meaning to. I just haven't gotten there yet, but I feel like that would provide some much-needed context that I would really like. Uh, Star Trek Picard countdown. The the story is about what Picard is doing doing during the supernova. Mm-hmm. But really, the, now that three issues are over, I kind of can talk about it. Uh, you, do you care for spoilers? Do you, do you want, not want me to say anything? No, that's okay. I, I'll okay. end up reading them, but I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on them. So. Okay. Our, our listeners know I spoil things all the time. So <laughs> that's not an issue at all. But uh, Star Trek Picard Countdown, really, the three issues are about how Jaban and Laris meet Picard. And things happen. And of course, I won't spoil what actually happens, but it ends with Jaban and Laris in like a very de- depressive place. And then Picard is like, I'm sorry this happened to you, but I have a vineyard. Would you like to? Because at the beginning, when you find them, they're like similarly working on like a vineyard uh, mm. on one of the planets called Uart Beta, which is the colony that's about this in the impact zone of the supernova. So that's where Picard is sent in a ship. Uh, to see if he can rescue some people before the supernova hits. Oh, that's and, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so on that planet, he finds both of them. And at that point, they're, they're Tal Shiar agents. Oh. So the story progresses from that to what actually happens to all of them. And it ends with Picard giving him an invitation to join them on his vineyard. And that's what that that story really is, is is the young or younger Jaban and Laris meeting a younger Picard. And oh. I highly recommend you read that because it's a lot of fun. Anyway, so the Jacques Vash are said to be these, uh, how do I put it? They're, they're more like a, the, the best analogy I could find is like they're the Freemasons. Oh, yeah, like you had evil, mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Like evil Freemasons, but because the Freemasons were technically there. They were doing it to like protect the country and yeah. uh, they didn't do a whole lot of evil things. But it seems like the Jacques Vache are there just to like kill and maim and cause destruction. Uh, yeah. But are you familiar with the Freemasons at all? They had like in the city that I grew up because they have like locations where they like meet and stuff like that. They mm-hmm. had one of those like the buildings not even a block away from where I lived, but I'm honestly not that familiar. So I'd love to know more. So please tell me more. Well, uh, Freemasonry is supposed to be this secret society that used to exist in uh, the United States. It said that it still exists, like the Illuminati oh. uh, in ancient Rome, uh, not Rome, in ancient Europe. Uh, so there are a lot of his, there is a lot of historical context there, but it's it's actually a bunch of organizations that used to be like secret and within specific locations at the time of independence for America. And they used to uh, plan in the back things that they could do to upend the the British to throw them off. That's kind of where like it has its origins uh, in, in that, but 
there are uh, there are these places today that that are called the lodges that mm-hmm. technically where they all go and meet and you're not supposed to find out about them but there's a lot of information about them on the internet like you can type up like i live in arkansas you can go like join freemason lodge arkansas and somebody will share a website somewhere so i don't know if it's as secret as it used to be but there are so many theories about like who used to be a freemason apparently george washington was a freemason hmm. and over time a lot of our presidents were freemasons uh, benjamin franklin there's a theory that he was freemason uh, just so many interesting things about uh, historical espionage which i thought was really cool that they introduced that but i wanted to tell you uh, just a little bit and maybe you might like it or maybe uh, you'll be like hey this is boring but there used to be a uh, an old old back in the i want to say second century ad uh, there used to be a guy in india called chanakya c h a n a k y a and people called him the king maker because he never actually became a king but he was once uh, he once so he was ugly to look at and he had crooked teeth and he had a limp leg so he once went to this big event thrown by a king and the king saw him there and he was like why is this ugly person here kick him out and he like made fun of him in public and he threw him out so chanakya went into uh, a forest and apparently for the next 28 years he discovered alchemy Oh. so he, he found little gold and he turned it into a lot of gold and with that gold he uh built his own secret army what he also found in the forest a few kids playing one day and one of those kids turned out to be uh the son of the actual king that this king who insulted him overthrew oh huh. so uh if this is this was called like this is the beginning of like the the maurya empire and it's like a whole story you can read but uh anyway all of this coming together like he then he has his money that he bu- builds an army with and he finds this kid that he trains to become a king and one day they just go and overtake the uh the kingdom so they with his army and this little guy oh. that they found and anyway chanak is called one of the masters of espionage because he did this and eventually he would go on to write some books on things like administrative intelligence and he writes about things like uh what's the value of keeping secrets from people if especially if you're like a king oh. it's kind of like not that different from the art of war which i'm sure you're familiar with mm-hmm. uh but it's like more about how to run a kingdom effectively so he wrote a lot of interesting books uh at least the ones that have survived about something like that and i just wanted to share that with you if people are interested let's it's a crazy fascinating story it's called his name is chanakya C H A N A K Y A That was really interesting. I'm fascinated <laughs> now. I want to go uh, look it up. You should. It's a he's he's a really really interesting character. Hey, so I believe what happens next is they go to uh they go to the house that mm-hmm. Daj was supposed to be in, right? Yeah, her apartment um and they it's kind of like I thought it was interesting in this episode when they went back and forth between the scenes in which Laris is telling Picard about the Javash and then also them like like in tandem also going to a scene where they're at the apartment like back and forth. So there's like a time jump there, but it wasn't too much that it took me out of it. I honestly thought it flowed really well because everything that they talked about, she says, "Oh, here's the exposition about the Javash." and then they would go into her apartment and she'd be scanning the apartment looking for like residual i don't know exactly how they explained it but like residual energy patterns so they could figure mm-hmm. out what happened and it would be like that's the explanation for the exposition that she just said and then it was kind of like a back and forth did you think it that was disjointed or did you think it was appropriate i thought it made sense because they didn't throw it in like toward the end of the show and then yeah. set up oh there is this thing called the shafash and then you see like a to be continued in blue in <laughs> tng fashion i'm glad they didn't do that uh, i'm glad if they're going to give us the exposition like a lot of information just give it to me all at once and then let yeah. me process it over the show uh so i thought that was pretty cool did you notice anything interesting in her apartment or things in the scene i honestly wasn't looking that hard okay. um i did notice some things that we'll talk about a little bit later 
but uh, you probably saw more Easter eggs than I did. So I don't get a chance. My uh, I use a VPN to watch Picard, and it doesn't mm-hmm. always work. So I am very sparingly epi- viewing the episodes as often as I can, but I can't just always go back and watch it again. Yay for Japan internet. And even having a VPN. Oh, well. I'll make it work. <laughs> well, I didn't notice any big uh, Easter eggs outright in these two scenes. But what I did notice is uh, somebody shared it online. But uh, I, I, I don't, I don't remember exactly what. But like she was doing the thing with her scanning, mm-hmm. where she was scanning the room, and somebody was like, C- "CSI Laris," because those are <laughs> the kinds of things that people do on CSI. Is they just like just throw things out there, and mm-hmm. uh, but that's that was pretty cool to see. Uh, did you also remember that uh, or did you also notice that uh, in the scene, Laris puts up this kind of database about the synths oh, and where yeah. they're moving mm-hmm. and then uh, Picard looks at it, right, as it's like going through. I was like, uh, you remember the X-Men movies yep. in which uh, a, uh, Professor X has a, a cerebra, which he puts on his head and watches the mutants. I was like, I don't know if that was a callback, but I was like, oh, that, that's him doing that again. Mm-hmm. But he's trying to find out more about uh, special people. Anyway, now we go. And they again, they call it off world. Like she's not on the planet. She's off world. Which to oh, me. About Soji? Mm-hmm. Or about, yeah. Uh, and they're like, she's not here. She's off world. Which again, off world to me is like a term from Blade Runner. That's mm-hmm. what I heard it. So I was like, these people are really jumping into it. Maybe it's just me. And I've watched Blade Runner so many times. Anytime no, anyone says I, anything about Blade Runner. Yeah, no, I see the connections too. You're not the only one. Actually, my husband, after we watched the premiere, he's like, I feel this, like this feels like Blade Runner. So you're mm-hmm. not the only one. You're not crazy. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, uh, so then we do jump off world and we go into the board cube where uh, Narek and Soji are <clears throat> assimilating. And uh, then <laughs> we we see them post assimilation talking to each other. But hey, before we jump into that scene, did you notice the plush on his bed? No. What was it? Okay. So I, I posted it on my Twitter. People can find it on twitter.com slash gutter underscore hero. Uh, it's a, there is a plush on his bed. And it's a plush of, I don't know what it is. But it's a creature, like an alien creature. Closest thing I can say is it's like if somebody created a chibi plush, you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Of the salt creature from the pilot. What? (laughs) Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. It has like a blue mane. And then grayish white fur. Yeah, go on my Twitter. You can see it right now. It's it's like it's right on his bed. And in the scene at one point, Soji throws it at him. And then he throws it back on the bed. And like nobody talks about it. I won like so many points to uh, Static Picard <laughs> for showing that guys can like plush toys too. Yes. I have a Godzilla plush by my bed. That's what oh, I talk. We have a do you ton. Have, you, do you have a, I don't have a ton. That's the only one I have right now. Um, oh, we have a lot of Pokemon plushies like in our car. Nice. What's your favorite Pokemon? Uh, Meryl. Ooh. The, like the water Pikachu essentially. Mm-hmm. Good mm-hmm. choice. Mine is Scyther. Ah. Uh, anyway, hey, so uh, that in that scene, you find out uh, that basically Narek has not told her anything about him. And she's fine with it. She's like, hey, just, you know, is there anything about you I can learn? And he's like, yeah, I'm a very private person. I don't tell people. <laughs> uh, that was pretty that was pretty interesting to me. Uh, so what do you think about both of these guys? Do you, do you like them so far? Uh, have you, uh, what do you think about their, their connection, where it's going? Where do you think it's going? I like it a lot, actually. I like that there really didn't have to be a lot of explanation as to why they are together. We see them in the first episode, and they, they're talking, and they really seem to hit it off. But there doesn't have to be like a long-standing relationship for that to happen. I mean, it's... I saw someone post something online about it, about some people were getting a little upset that oh, well, you can't have that happen in Star Trek. Like, you can't have them just, like, be together, right? Or they can't be doing the stuff. <laughs> and with, with, uh, without it, like, hey, like, with Data and Tasha, like, there's a little bit there. Or with, like, Deanna and Riker, there's a little bit there. And I'm like, well, Soji is an adult. 
she has like rights over her own body. She can make her own decisions. She's intelligent. Why is everyone like blowing the roof off of this? I like them together a lot. I think it's really fascinating. And I think she is fascinated by him. She likes that she doesn't have him all figured out. She wants to kind of mm-hmm. dig into that. Yeah. And she, I mean, of course, she doesn't know what we know about mm-hmm. him after seeing this episode. But I think that she kind of thrives on that fascination about him. So I, I think Narek is really cool as a character. Uh, I still don't know what side he is playing or maybe he's playing both sides. Mm. Uh, because I felt what he's trying to do. But so far, I feel like he has like a real relationship with her. But maybe yeah. that's all part of the act. Uh, because uh, I know he's trying to get to something with her. He wants to know more about everything that's going on. And But he, I feel like he's like still giving her a good amount of uh, affection. Maybe that's all part of the plan for him. But uh, I'll say this. Uh, Na- the guy who's playing Narek... Harry Treadaway is in uh, Penny Dreadful, which is a show that I religiously watched and <laughs> I moaned and I wept uh, roaming the halls, as uh, Spock would say, while uh, when it was cancelled. But it's a, sh- it's a show that ran for three seasons. And the show is basically, if, no, if you guys don't know about it, it's, uh, it takes place in Victorian era London, where a bunch of characters from the classic fiction of that time, like uh, Dr. Frankenstein, and Frankenstein's monster, and Van Helsing, and uh, 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 a cowboy, like just a typical cowboy character, and a, a, who's, who we call a witch or a medium, she can talk to the dead. And they all come together to find Dracula. And that's what the show, that's where the show starts. That's how crazy it is. Uh, anyway, Harry Treadaway plays Dr. Frankenstein on that show. Uh, so I highly recommend you guys go check it out. I think it's on Netflix. I don't have Netflix. So I don't know. But maybe. I feel like if it's not, it was at one point. I'd have to check again. My husband watched it not that long ago, and it was on Netflix. Also, for all of you Doctor Who fans, Billy Piper, who plays Rose Tyler in uh, Doctor Who, she's also on the show, mm-hmm. and she's wonderful. So you should definitely watch it. Yeah, she's the bride of Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. So she's the next... Uh, uh, person that he resurrects, quote unquote. But hey, it's and Dorian Gray is in the show. If you guys know who that is, but yes, please check it out. Penny Dreadful is an awesome show. All, all the while, I was thinking, hey, I was looking at Narek and I was like, that guy's costume is so cool. He looks so cool. I, I really want a Narek pin. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for them to eventually make a Narek pin because they have to, right? Yeah, I hope uh, so. Also, I'm going to ask you because I don't know if I am going crazy, but. In the scene when they're in the bedroom, you see Narek have like, he has a little thing on his ear. And I don't know if that's meant to be like an embellishment, like an earring, but he's got a little like thing in one of his ears. And I don't know what that is. If it's just like cultural, perhaps, or if it actually means something. Did you see that or am I crazy? I did not see it, but uh, it could be a hearing aid. Maybe. So, uh, no, I did not notice his hearing aid, but I will look for it the next time I watch the episode, uh, for sure. But all the while I was thinking, hey, I need a Narek pin because I like the way he looks. And speaking of pins, uh, I don't know if the people out there know this, but we are sponsored by Fansets, uh, which is the coolest place to get your pins of all kinds. I have been on their website so many times. Now I even know the character descriptions that they've written. <laughs> For everything from their Star Trek pins to their DC Comics pins, uh, they they have Harry Potter pins. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just every every fandom they're doing their best to get it in there. I think they're getting Hanna Barbera oh. this year too, which is uh, really interesting. Hanna Barbera or one of the older cartoon ones, uh, which I'm really excited about. But uh, speaking of which, uh, we recently found out this was big news to us. I plugged it in the last episode, but we now have a discount code. Woo-hoo. All. I know, all all for this little weird show. Anyway, if people are interested in getting stuff, they already have a Star Trek Picard series out, what they're calling Wave 1. So they have a number one pin. They have number one with a Santa hat. Uh, they have a number one dog tag. So it's not technically a pin, but you could pin it for your dog. I'm waiting to get that for Zod. Mm-hmm. But you can, there are so many pins out there, you guys. They have hundreds, hundreds of Star Trek pins from every show. Uh, there and the movies. Uh, just please check them out. Uh, it's on fansets.com. And if you use this discount code, Polytrex, 
P O L I T R E K S. When you check out, they have a promo code place where you can put it. You get a fifteen percent discount. So their pins are already pretty cheap. They're like six bucks per pin, but you use this code, you get even more of a discount. So definitely check out fan sets. And I'm waiting for that Narek pin. I did a little ca- Twitter campaign earlier that Ali helped me with. In which I was like, I need an F8 pin, you guys. Yes. But they saw it and they're like, we're going to put it in like wave two or wave three. So I can't wait for that one. Uh, but for all your pin needs, make sure you go to Fansets. Fansets are pins of character. Anyway, Ooh. so back to the episode. Uh, I looked up some photos while you were talking and I realized, yeah, there is something in his ear. It's almost like a little, uh, those little Bluetooth earbuds. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know what that is. I want. I feel like it's an it's a hearing aid, but they don't talk mm. about it because, you know, that's what Star Trek is. You don't like. Yeah. You don't make a big deal about people's uh, disabilities, physical or mental. But anyway, so back to the show. Next thing that happens is uh, Picard finds out she's off world. So after this conversation, we go back to him, and he goes to Starfleet. Right, that's where this happens. If I remember mm-hmm. correctly, the next thing is uh, him going to Starfleet, and then uh, as soon as he comes to Starfleet HQ, the old music plays, which I Ooh, thought was a nice touch. Yes, uh, goosebumps all the way. Right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he he arrives there, uh, he walks up, and then they show his Enterprise and Pike's Enterprise in a hologram on top mm-hmm. when he enters the building. Do you know what that building is? Um, it's the Anaheim Convention Center. Yes. And you know why I know that? Because I've been to concert? WonderCon there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they also have BlizzCon uh, there, if I remember correctly. Yes. But they have a bunch of the popular cons that happen around the country. But yes, it is the Anaheim Convention Center. How uh, fitting that he would go to a convention center in a show <laughs> that is a sci-fi fan favorite show. It's, uh, I, I thought that was, that was such a nice... I don't know if that was intentional... Or it just worked out that way, but if it did, way to go, guys! Good, good selection. <laughs> uh, d- what else did you like about that scene? I, I, uh, I like that at the reception, the receptionist person didn't know who he was. Yeah, he was like, uh, "What was your name?" And he sits like Picard's just like taken aback. He's like, "Excuse me." Yeah. But before that even starts, I love seeing the public transporters because we don't. I'm not for sure, but I don't know that we see it so prominently in any of the other series. I mean, it's always assumed that they exist, but just being able to see him like walk through and a bunch of other people walk through, I'm like, oh man, can that technology exist right now so I can come and hang out with you guys, you and Barry, and go to STLV and all that Mm -hmm. good stuff? (laughs) (laughs) But I loved it when... Like, after the receptionist doesn't know Picard's name, then he just, like, kind of slaps him with that visitor's pass, and Picard's like, oh, and then, like, wanders off. And I love it. It's perfect. <laughs> it was a... Uh, there was somebody also made, uh, like, a post or two about someone we see in the background while he's walking up to Starfleet. I think it's called Romsu. R-H-O-M-S-E-W. It's this alien character uh, that's in the background. Uh People should look that up, but it's she's like a walk on part for now. We don't know when she'll show up again, but it's like a like red uh, makeup and had like a uh, weird hair. It's is there something interesting that I noticed, but it's like it's called they called her Romsu. I think didn't Trekcore post like a photo mm-hmm. of her and like yeah, the, that's what I found it. Yeah, face? yeah. And interesting thing is it's it's called Romsu, but if you go to her Instagram, uh, the actress Instagram, you'll find out Romsu spelled. Oh, backwards phonetically is Westmore, and the person playing it is Westmore. Oh. Like that's a last name, so they're like, "Hey, we will call your character backwards." Uh, I, I thought that was that. that was pretty nice of them. Uh, anyway, so he goes up to Starfleet uh, just to, and you find out why he's there. Uh, he gets his little visitor badge on. I think that was like one of the first pins that came out. Mm-hmm. I think it was made by fansets for especially the public. PR campaign they were doing so they could give it out to people. Uh, so he goes up to the this the main office of Admiral Clancy, right? Yeah. Kirsten Clancy. Have we mm-hmm. seen her before? She looks super familiar. And I'm not exactly sure if she's in any of the other iterations. But I feel like I have heard someone 
on like online that had said that she had appeared in Star Trek before. Do you have the answer to this question? No, I do not. I, ju- I do not. I couldn't find anything. Even Memory Alpha was like, hey, we said this is her first time appearing. I think like she, she looks a lot like the woman who yelled at Picard in TNG. Oh. Like, uh, in all, like uh, the woman who yelled at him uh, after the events of Iborg. It is like, you let a Borg go. Oh, you're and talking then, about N- Nache- Necheyev? Is that mm-hmm. what it is? Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, the woman that takes over when uh, in Best of Both Worlds, she's not quite an admiral yet, but she's online with uh, Riker. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was like, yeah, that kind of looks familiar. I feel like they were going for a similar motive. But so he goes to uh, he goes to talk to Admiral Clancy and he basically says, hey, we found out that Romulans and the Sins are involved and there are things going on. And I need you to reinstate my command. Just give me a small ship. Give me a small skeleton crew. That's all I need. And if it's such an issue, just take my rank down to captain. I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, I'm glad Picard has a choice in it. But if people will remember, Kirk did not have a choice in going back down to captain uh, mm-hmm. in uh, in his movies. Uh, but that was an interesting connection, I thought. But that conversation goes and she basically yells at him. Uh, in response, she's like, how dare you think you can just walk in here and just ask for people to take you to space when, and we all saw this when one episode ago, he's bad mouthing Starfleet across the universe. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, it was hard to watch like Picard being treated that way. But I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I think it was like a warranted reaction. Like, of course she's upset. Like, like you said, he just went on in front of literally the whole galaxy mm -hmm. and just, dissed Starfleet so yeah she's not gonna he's not gonna walk in there and sit down and she's not gonna be happy-go-lucky about it because I mean they have an image they have to uphold Mm -hmm. she talks about in in their conversation about how important it was to like uphold images for the Federation to make sure that the important world stayed within the Federation when the attacks happened so yeah that image is important and Picard yes of course we want him to be able to carry out this mission and let that story unfold. But also it's not completely out of the blue that she would just be like, yeah, all's good. All's well. Here's a Mm -hmm. ship. Go ahead. You know, we go to the bar cube where we find out it's essentially an artifact. That's what they call it. The artifact. It's a bar cube recovered from a previous war and it's disconnected from the collective. And we see a little bit more about what goes on every day. So we go to Soji. She's helping this new doctor put her outfit on. And did you notice how their outfits were very similar to the outfits on Utopia Planitia? Yes. I was going to say that, but you took it from me. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) You'd think they would like at least not do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, After what happened there, maybe give them a different color of outfit. But I guess I kind of get it. <laughs> but anyway, so they put on this bat. They put on each other's badges as Soji is helping her. Uh, she's a trill, right? The lady she's helping. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because I saw the trill dots on her face, mm-hmm. and uh, so I think the name was like Doctor Nishan or Nashan for the person she's helping. And they both put on each other's badges, and they're like, "You don't want to go in the into the gray zone without these badges on." And we don't quite know what the gray zone is yet. But they mention it and then you see uh, them getting the spiel before they're sent inside the cube to what we find out is uh, the real operation is in the cube. They found all the previous Borg and they're helping dismantle them and bring hopefully bring them back to life Mm -hmm. uh, from their previous Borg life or their assimilated life. And we'll talk a little bit more about what actually Soji does on that ship. But then Narek is in the in the background and they're both commenting on how hot he is, which, again, of course, <laughs> why wouldn't he do that? Uh, so Narek comes up and he starts talking to them. And then you find out a little bit more about uh, what they're all doing. And uh, Dr. Nishan talks about how is it a good idea to, like, help all these Borg come back to life? Uh, and then they're talking about, you know, they're not really Borg anymore. They've been disconnected. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I hope that's the case and that's not what will blow up and they all won't come back to life. Uh, but uh, what, did, what did you think of that scene? What, just the setting in general. I like that they just threw us into the dirty underworld 
and how the work uh, goes on. I really like the guy who was talking to them and giving them the announcements, the Romulan with the Mohawk that I mm-hmm. thought was really cool. <laughs> what did you think of that scene? Yeah, I liked it a lot. I um, My husband was the first one to pick out that on the wall they had like 5,843 days since the last assimilation or whatever the number was. Mm-hmm. It was super like... <laughs> I just couldn't stop laughing because how like perfectly placed is that? I I don't think it's tacky. I think it's fun. Mm-hmm. But I also love when uh, there's a little like portion of the scene where after Soji helps the doctor get all of her get up on that she goes and talks to Narek and he's like asking her questions about like what she's doing and she's like I'm sorry you'll have to like talk to the director of mm-hmm. Borg the Borg reclamation project to mm-hmm. know more and he's like actually I don't have to and then it like transitions into the next scene and I love that um my husband didn't pick it up he said well why does not he need that like clearance and I'm like well I mean correct me if I'm wrong but I suppose that inference would be well he is the director of the Borg Reclamation Project, and that's why he was allowed to be in there. Is that? Am I going crazy? Am I overstepping? Or is well, that... that's no, that's a fair point, and I I wouldn't have contested it. Uh, you mean Narek is the director, right? Yes. I wouldn't have contested it had I not seen again the ready room in which they show a preview scene from episode three, and you kind of see one person looking in the background as Soji does her thing uh, later in the episode, and if you see on the other side of the glass, what they're watching and monitoring. And uh, one person is watching them do all this and they, they zoom in on him and it's Hugh. Oh, so I am, see, and I don't then, get to see any of this stuff. I am ah. so sorry. Uh, I hate that. And uh, I think what really happens is afterward, Hugh goes and talks to her. And that's part of the scene. He's like, uh, you find out that when Soji's doing her autopsy later in the episode, uh, she's talking to that person who has died in their own language. When she says... Uh, like see you later friend or farewell friend or something. Yeah. Like that. And then he was like, that is remarkable that you know that person's language. And then uh, that's where he was introduced. So I'm wondering if he is the director, but it could very well be possible that uh, Narek is the director. So that's my theory is that it's you uh, because it makes sense that he would be the guy who would be doing something like this because yeah. he was once famously reclaimed. Um, but we'll find out more as that happens. Did you like... Uh, did you, I liked that Soji is not just some damsel in distress who's like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I'll just let you in. You know, I'll risk everything for you. She's like, nope, we know where this relationship starts and ends. She puts some boundaries. Yeah, that. yeah, she really yeah. does take control. And even, I'm assuming it's with her higher-ups, like one of the Romulans was taking like the arm off one of the disconnected drones and calling them all nameless. And she's like, why do you call them nameless? Like, there are people mm-hmm. and for her to even like, she's confident enough to voice that um, even possibly in the face of her superior. I don't know if that yeah. woman was or not. That's that. It was just such a, I'm so excited to see where all this goes. I love the way the bar cube looks. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I cannot wait to see seven Ooh. in this environment. That is going to be crazy. Uh, I cannot wait to see Hugh. I cannot wait to see, if there is a scene with Seven, Hugh, and Picard in one scene, I'm done. Like I'm I just going to faint. Yeah. I'll flatline. <laughs> just I will make sure I have my CPR machine ready to go. Uh, but then we jump back to uh, the vineyard where we find out that Picard is trying to start doing things on his own. And then he we see him take out his old comm badge because he's realized he's not going to get any help here. He puts it on and then he asks a musiker for help. Uh, and then... If people do not know, Musiker is, you'll find out more about their relationship in the episode, uh, especially episode three has some background, but she used to be in Starfleet with Picard. And if you have read Countdown, you'll know that she was his first officer in this mission that they go to the super, when the supernova is happening, she is his first officer and she calls him JL uh, all the time. And he keeps saying, don't call me JL, call me like captain. And she's like, nope, that's not happening. And uh, <laughs> it's like just a funny thing that they have going on with, between them. So he says, Musiker, you're kind of supposed to infer that that's his first officer that he's calling out to you. Then he has a little bit of a conversation with uh, Jaban. And Jaban says, hey, maybe you should reach out to Worf uh, and Riker and Jordi and see if they can help. And he's like, I'm sure they would, but this is kind of not about them. 
yeah. and I don't want them to. I don't want anyone else that is near and dear to me to lose their life because he is he has been dealing with data's death for so long. He does not want the possibility that someone else will die, the, yeah. especially someone that he's close to. Uh, did you? Uh, so um, again, a connection I wanted to make and throw at you in the comic calm down it opens really uh in, on utopia planitia and you find out that jordy is the head engineer on utopia planitia uh oh and then the comic ends again with jordy and picard having a conversation where again still he is still the engineer on utopia planitia but this takes place 20 years before the actual event so we don't know where jordy really is if okay. he died on utopia planitia or if he's alive because Picard kind of infers that he is alive because he's mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, he they'll all come if I need them to, but I don't want them to. So it's like a bit of a mystery. I'm sure it's on purpose because one of the writers of Countdown is Kirsten Byer, mm-hmm. and she is one of the co-creators of the show. So I'm sure it's very intentional. So what did you think of that scene? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what uh, his, the doctor that shows up. But what did you think about their conversation and him picking up the old badge again and putting it on? I. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like for me when we got to see him put it on and like the look on his face, it's very it's kind of like that feeling that I got when he walked out at STLV and said he was going to do the Picard show and yeah. it's just kind of like that raw like giddiness and for something that might seem to many other people like such a small like thing, oh, he put his combat on, right? But then the rest of us were like, "Oh, what's he going to do?" We're freaking out. and not i mean i didn't have that background from countdown but i had seen musker like i had seen the covers of the comics so and her in uniform mm-hmm. so i very much assumed that she was a part of starfleet but now i know that she was his first officer so that's some good information but i think it's also for a lot a lot of us perhaps when we heard uh jaban refer to you know those names that we know so well uh wharf and riker and laforge we i kind of like my breath stopped a little bit cuz i didn't know what was going to happen after that and i i think they played it off very well because although we're going to be seeing these characters returning some cuz we know diana's coming back and we know riker's coming back and with hugh and seven but they've d- done multiple interviews and talked about the show and saying this is not a revival of TNG it's not meant to be the story is supposed to go in a different direction and while being able to see those characters back well we also know that Guinan is coming back for season 2 that's exciting mm-hmm. but knowing that these characters can come back and yet the story can still continue without them we know that they're there we know that we don't know exactly where they are in the star trek universe like you said where what happened to jordy on mm. is did something happen at utopia planitia we, we know we're going to see troy and riker but we don't really know so much about that yet but i'm glad that they're taking it in a different direction because while some might be content with a hey let's get the crew all back together and do another tng i'm really really liking these new characters i'm really really liking this story that refers back to TNG lore but isn't cemented as TNG. I don't know, am I making sense? Am I sounding crazy? No, that was a great point. I'm so glad you said that. Give people the unexpected, right? That's what it's yeah. about. Uh and to me, watching the show because I'm such a fan of sci-fi and if anything sci-fi is supposed to always do the unexpected. Like teach you new things about yourself, teach you new things about the world. Uh and you know, and and I would have loved A, a TNG reunion, just all of them doing a whole show again, uh, all of them back together. But the biggest problem with that is one episode, two episodes in, it becomes tiresome, and mm-hmm. you're like, I've seen this before, I've seen it multiple times on different shows and different iterations. Why are we doing this again? Uh, but so yes, I'm glad they're not doing that, and I'm glad uh, it's all about the new characters. And the new characters are a lot of fun. Uh, but hey, so now we go back to the vineyard where we see a few meetings happen. uh the first one is now picard is trying to find out more information about uh where he needs to go what he needs to do so he puts on his com badge he uh, and tries to reach out to his friends we see two more uh calls in the vineyard before he has to 
before the end of the episode the first one is dr jurati comes up uh, she comes to visit him at the vineyard and dr jurati is the same person we met in episode 1 she's the one who talks about the positive neural nets and uh, she's the one who basically tells us that they're made in tw- they're created as twins and they come together as twins uh, uh, the all the synths or synthetics and then you find out that there is a soji uh, anyway she shows up to talk to picard and uh, they both they both have an exchange where he want he wants to find out more about what's going on a couple of interesting uh, things here he likes that she asked for earl grey tea uh, that was a that was a nice touch i thought uh, and she picks up this book about uh, called robot by asimov are you familiar with isaac asimov at all yes okay uh, now what did you think of that scene that was a, i thought that was a good information oh, yeah. exchange it was like a uh, you need some levity right everything is so serious Yeah. I felt like this was a lighthearted positive scene that gave us some information but also it was more about hey it's you know two friends meeting and talking to each other. Yeah. I mean you got to love the Picard like I never was really into science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like wait a minute. <laughs> oh, I couldn't stop laughing. But I like that it's we're able to get a lot of information but it doesn't have to with like the serious tone of everything that we've seen so far. It doesn't have to be like you said not everything has to be terrible not everything has to be sad not everything has to be like ooh they're still talking about important information like the fact that Maddox has disappeared we figure out that he's disappeared i mean i i feel like it was assumed in the even in the first episode that he had because of the fact that he wasn't at the Daystrom Institute i knew something was up with him but um and then also the idea that i mean Maddox would have modeled Daj and Soji off of the painting that Data had drawn and that their identities had been built all at once rather than like oh well all the stuff that we saw about her mother and her past and I mean that was mentioned a little bit when um Laris was kind of talking about hey well that's not it, it's not really feasible that all this had really continued for quite some time but then we get confirmation of it that well it's more likely that all these memories were at once constructed and then placed in and to them it it doesn't seem like anything else that the passage of time feels normal to them because their mind has made them think that it is i just thought it was really interesting that we got all this information and it wasn't too i don't know it wasn't too the word i'm going to say is like techno babbly cuz some episodes will throw out like all this ridiculous techno babble that absolutely has no way of me like quantum temporal rift in the blah 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 and my brain sits there like well yeah i know that they had to insert some science term in there and i'm sure dr aaron mcdonald could tell me everything i needed to know <laughs> mm-hmm. but i like that it was enough science for me to be able to follow as someone who would love to be better at science than i was in high school but i can still wrap my mind around this whole like cloning process i suppose as yeah, it's, as best as someone can no it's accessible techno babble and uh, i just wanted to give you a couple more like interesting things about isaac asimov uh so he wrote a lo- lot of his stories involved robots being built and mm-hmm. then breaking free very his one of mo- his most popular because everybody knows it because it became a movie it's called i robot yes that's his and he's the one who devised very famously the three laws of robotics about what robots are supposed to do on people but yeah you're right it's accessible techno babble like i i might not understand the complexities of like wavelength hypertronic <laughs> all of those things but i can understand i understand robots i understand androids i understand clones i understand positive neural nets because those are things i i can understand and that's about where they keep it and i appreciate it and it's great it's uh like you you like you said it doesn't get in the way of you enjoying the story if nothing else you can explain it to a simple person saying hey may they make these human robot type things that have broken free and picard is trying to like find out why that's happening and yeah. that's about all you need to know uh anyway while all this is going on speaking of you know uh too perf- she calls too perfect she's like to ob- it might be too uh, dash might have been too perfect uh, candidate for daystrom it was like 
all of this suspicion is going on. And then we go back to Starfleet for a quick second where Clancy is talking to a Commodore O. Yeah, that's what I got. Mm -hmm. A Vulcan Commodore. Uh, or at least we we're supposed we to think. think. It's, yeah, she. You know, you know how I know she's not Vulcan. I don't think a Vulcan would put up a pin of the IDIC symbol right in front of them, mm -hmm. for and not for them to see, but the person in front of them to see. The Vulcans are not. They're they're nothing. They're anything but like uh, projecting and pompous people mm -hmm. who like want everybody to know what they're about. She puts it on a pedestal on the table. But not for herself. She puts it for the person in front of them to see. I was like, well, this person is definitely not a Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then Vulcan Commodore O and Clancy have a conversation where Clancy is like, uh, she's just basically calling and talking to her and saying, hey, uh, so Picard came by. It's sad what he, become, what he has become. He used to be such a great man. Now he's talking about crazy things like... Uh, some saints and Romulans working together and uh, like saints have been broken and they're trying to make more out of them. It's like, we, I don't know what's going on. And then Commodore O assures her, she's like, you know, I'm sorry Picard said that to you. It's tragic. That's the word she uses. But she's like, uh, but just so you know, if something like that was going on, I would know about it. And Clancy's mm -hmm. like, yeah, 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 I know. I just wanted to like tell you what was going on. And you're kind of not supposed to think anything about that scene. But what do you think about that short exchange? Like, could you tell from the scene that she's not who she's trying to be? Yes, I think it was very apparent, even in, like, even with the display that she made of, like, that kind of, that Vulcan persona, I feel like even a little bit of it was, like, taken a little bit further than I would have expected it. Because, like, the, the exchange in which they have really reminded me of when in Enterprise, when T'Pol is struggling to to maintain her emotions and we start to see like that, like anger or irritation or whatever surface a bit. And that's what I was getting from Commodore O. So I was like, well, something is either not right here or why on earth would a Vulcan be in league with the Romulans? And also... Fun fact, if you didn't notice, in her office as well, Commodore O's office, if you look in the very back, there's a set of the Vulcan bells that you see from a mock time. Uh, I didn't notice that myself, but someone posted about that on Twitter, and it, they're just barely visible, like, in the back corner. And I was like, <gasps> because a mock time is one of my very favorite episodes of Star Trek, so. That's awesome. I did not notice that. I need to catch that. That's what the rewatches are for, right? So you can mm -hmm. catch all those things. Uh, so anyway, from here, now we go back to this, the one final call in the vineyard, which is heartbreaking and sad. I'm going to, I'm just, I'm not going to say a whole lot about it, but uh, we see Picard call on his friend, Dr. Benny Yoon from the Stargazer. And uh, for people who are interested, there's a really cool comic that came out early last year. It's called Star Trek 2020. It talks a little bit more about the history of Picard on the Stargazer and it's the story of how Crusher and Picard meet. Uh, people should check that out. They're just a recommendation. Uh, but so the in the vineyard, he we find out that Picard is he needs to be certified before he can leave for interstellar travel. Uh, and so Dr. Ben Yoon, his doctor on the Stargazer, comes up and uh, he arrives and they have a little friendly exchange. And then Dr. Ben Yoon's like, well, I did my checkups and I found out that you're OK for the most part. And this might not be nothing or it could be something bad. And then he talks about how he has an issue in his parietal lobe, which, if people remember, is something that Crusher mentions in All Good Things. So that's a, it's a, it looks like that, that has, uh, what, he, what we had all feared is actually happening in the show. It said that Picard is 92. That's his age when we see him, at least from the starter Picard podcast. So it's remarkable that at 92, he's, he's doing his best to be up and about, but that was, a, that was a tough scene. That was a tough, uh, uh, thing to watch. Essentially, if you guys really don't know, the, the simplest version is he he has uh, what we can consider very close to cancer. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen with him. There is a season two. So either he's going to live with it or they're going to find some way to help him out of it. And Dr. Benyun does express some hope. He's like, you know, there are options. Like, 
there's, there's a ways you can work around it. But what do you think of that scene, Ali? I was heartbroken, of course, as I feel like many of us are. But I think in in very much Picard fashion, at almost the very end of the scene, um, Dr. Benyon says, you know, well, Picard explains his plans to him. Like, hey, I need to be certified. And the doctor says, well, even after I've told you all of this about what's happening, you still want to go back out there, like into the unknown, into the cosmos. And Picard says this like beautiful thing. I don't know exactly the words, but something along the lines of like, of course, like knowing all of that, that makes me want to go out there and solve this mystery even more Mm -hmm. than I did before. Because not that it didn't, not that it didn't have meaning before, because of course it does, because it's about data. And he says many times in both the very first or the first episode and the second episode, you know, it's it's my duty after like, I mean, mourning and grieving for 20 some years about data that if he hears any whisperings and now he has confirmation about Daesh and Soji or at least a little bit more than we had before of course he's going to do something. He has to. It's He feels it's his right, it's his duty to do it in the very most Picard fashion that I could possibly imagine. Because that is Picard, right? Mm-hmm. He does it because he knows it's right. And I, I don't know if there's anything else I can add to that. Yeah, that was, a, <laughs> that was very well put. Yes, that is who Picard is. is uh, that's what, when when he's faced with danger, that's when he thrives and... Uh, when he's faced with something like this, of course he'd want to go back out there. And especially because nobody else is there that he can rely on to help him with this. Maybe if that was the case, uh, something might have been worked out with uh, a person that he could have trusted. But as you can see, uh, not everybody feels that way because then they cut to Jaban Laris talking to him about this and he's like, you know, I want to go out there. Presumably, he's told them about his diagnosis. Mm. And uh, she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, please go out there. If it's important for Picard, it's important for everyone, right? That's how that works. And you can tell just uh, how how complex the situation is. And both of them do not want him to go. Uh, but they understand it. Uh, they react to it in very different ways. Jaban, uh, Jaban is quiet and he's taking it in. And Laris is like, Oh no, please take my husband too. Like, just go, go and die. Like, that's what you guys want. And she, <laughs> yeah. she storms out. Uh, that's sass coming back. And uh, Jaban is very quietly talking to him. And that's where we find out he tells him about, hey, Jordi, uh, LaForge Riker. That's where the conversation happens. And uh, he, I don't know, that was a, so I, I guess this is like about what we'll see of the two of them. Or do you think we'll see them? we'll see any more of them soon i mean i hope so i i feel like if the story is going to progress in like the natural form in which we think it would in which picard would work with musikar to get a ship and a crew and go out and try to find soji that we might not get to see as much of them as we would like but i i don't think this is the end of what we'll see of them I would like to see for how close of a a relationship that they seem to have with Picard, that there would be something else there or perhaps something while they're gone will take place on earth in which the two of them will dive into or attempt to look for more information. I hope so. I really do because especially for Laris, I think that in, in the situation where he was saying, you know, she's just spouting out like, oh yeah, this is so dangerous. Go, go do it. Like whatever, because that's just like her personality. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that that kind of personality is such a good like balance for Picard because Mm -hmm. like, he's the one who's like, uh, here's like my, in a way, like here's my nobleness and here's why I'm doing this and it is right. And so everything, like everyone should agree with me because it's right. And then a lot of times he is, but then Laris just comes back with like, all right, fine, like, just go do it. And I think that, like, juxtaposition is really nice to see. Someone who will, like, give Picard, like, a run for his money. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, was really cool uh, watching them. I hope this is not the last I I see of them, but not spotted in this episode was number one. Where is number one, you guys? Give us number one, you cowards. 
Oh, Why can't there be number one? Bring her there, back. Yeah, there can be two number ones on that ship. Bring her on the ship. Just make yes. sure, just do something with number one. Bring number one back. Is hashtag bring number one back. Hashtag justice for number one. Hashtag never forget number one. I would I'm really. Gonna, like, it's going to be a thing. It's going to trend. <laughs> it's going to be trending. I, I'm I'm ready for number one to come back, you guys. Uh, but then you cut to, uh, you cut back to O and Rizal. We find we meet this new character called Lieutenant Rizzo, who's masquerading mm-hmm. as a human, uh, but they talk uh, to each other about. It looks like Picard found out a little scheme that we are cooking. So then, if anybody didn't know, it looks like this is the whole thing. And is it? Does it infer that they are members of the Shakwash? I think that's what we're we're meant to expect because they do talk about the. Um, they have the conversation about the agents that came and killed Taj. Mm -hmm. So it's assumed that they, because something about, Hey, the first, like the first time people found out when she was talking to Rizzo, when Commodore O was like, well, the first time with the first one, like now people know. So you better do better with this one. Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. So yeah, I think it's an inference that they are. So that conversation was fun. One thing I noticed is that there, so there are three Romulans in Jatvash that we know of so far. And only one of them is in like an actual Romulan. One of them is a human, mm-hmm. Lieutenant Rizel, she's masquerading as a human. And then Commodore O is masquerading as a Vulcan. So you're getting all shades of how deep their uh, espionage can go. So anyway, then we see, uh, we see that little exchange where we find out, oh, yep, they're they are all in Starfleet. And that kind of shows you where Starfleet is and what they've become. And uh, the fact that they couldn't have noticed something like this is pretty crazy to me. But then you find out that Picard has taken a cab uh, to go visit uh, Musiker, <laughs> a space cab, and then he arrives at her doorstep and she has a gun held up to her. Uh, she's dressed very much, I thought she looked very much like Sarah Connor in uh, T2 ah. uh, with her hat and the way she looked. Uh, that that felt very reminiscent to me. She, they, she's in like a desert-like atmosphere and she's like, get in that cab and go away and not show up. And then He's like, there are Romulans, and since they're working together, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. But she doesn't really care about that. When he holds his hands up, because she points his gun at him, he has a bottle of wine. And she's like, is that the 86? And he's like, <laughs> slowly lifts it up. And then she, she throws her water away, so making her glass ready to pour that in. She's like, damn it, come on in. And uh, you see that they are, I'm sure we'll see more of that actual conversation when they sit down and talk. But then now it jumps to what is the, the final scene of the episode, uh, right? That's the, is that the last, is that the last episode, if I remember correctly? Yeah. Oh, sorry, where, sorry. Is that the last scene, if I remember correctly? Yeah, because we go back to the cube where we see like the hologram of Rizzo talking to um, uh, Narek. Yes. yes. And Narek is, uh, so then we go back to the cube where, and Rizzo has come to give her brother a warning. We find out that they're brother and sister. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, you look ridiculous in that human get up. Like, when, mm-hmm. like, at the beginning of the episode, we see him assimilating with a human. Come on, dude, make up your mind. Like, just- He also, to be fair, is like a, a I don't want to say human looking Romulan, but um, I was watching a behind the scenes video that Star Trek put out recently um, talking with Neville Page about the the Romulan, like what makes a Romulan, and what's interesting about that is in that video they show Commander O or Commodore O in the like what makes a Romulan video, and I was like, oh, is that proof that she's yeah. a Romulan? <laughs> but they talk about how some have like that more prominent forehead mm-hmm. feature and um, like the eyebrows, but I think like we see a lot more. Um, like I guess human features from Narek that we then like you mentioned the one of the Romulans the one that was explaining about the like assimilation procedures the one with like that mohawk thing earlier Mm -hmm. so yeah I think um, (laughs) who is he to talk (laughs) well uh, that that scene basically says they're setting up the world and it's like Mm -hmm. oh we know there is a Jatvash agent like Narek is part of the Jatvash they're all or they're all Jatvash and they're talking to each other and she's like she gives him a warning he's like I'm top of it I'm on top of it and she's like oh yeah it looks like it and she points to his bed <laughs> and uh, uh, she basically says stop messing around we need to get things done and it's like they're going deeper into the mystery 
we might we might see some kind of action being taken against everything that is going on as uh, picard gets ready with musikar hopefully to get a ship together and that's where the episode ends now i wanted to talk to you about a couple of things on the episode one what how did you feel about the cussing there's a, there's a couple of times that people cuss yeah um i don't think it is unrealistic to expect that cussing would not happen in the future because it very much happens now i don't have a problem with it I think that the way that they use it is actually very tasteful and very similar to other times in other series that we've seen our characters cuss. So it doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. Uh I think like in the the context in which we hear it like um with Admiral Clancy when she says like sheer whatever. You guys know what I'm saying. Mm. I don't want to curse sheer her, effing but, hubris. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I think that that's like warranted. Like the the cussing is not a problem for me. I don't okay. know. What did you think? Good. I'm indifferent to it, but it did feel a little shoehorned in to me. The times they were doing it, like with uh, Lara's doing it in her Irish accent, and then uh, then uh, Clancy doing it. Like the the three four times that it happens, in the episode, I felt like it was shoehorned in. I wonder if they're already. Uh, I hope at some point they work on like a family safe version because outside of that there is nothing really scary in this episode or things that mm-hmm. kids cannot watch. I'm sure for those that complain at some point CBS All Access would be like here's a family safe version where mm-hmm. they've cut out all the cussing so people will stop complaining. Yeah, I was indifferent to it. Another thing I wanted to ask you, uh just a couple of things that I noticed. Did you do you see any non white Romulans anywhere in the two episodes. Oh. Now that I think about it, I don't know that is, I do. Is Commodore O uh is she Asian or is she half Asian? I suppose. Uh, I was like, you know, because even on the sh- on the artifact, if you look at the background, mm-hmm. all the Romulans they're white. Or at least yeah. the ones that notice they're all white. Maybe I'm missing something. But I was like, you know, I'm sure there are like brown Romulans, you guys. Show us some, yeah. you cowards. Um, there, we know a brown Vulcan. Why can't we have a brown Romulan? Uh, but that was Hashtag something. Hashtag brown Romulans. Hashtag <laughs> justice for brown Romulans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that was, uh, overall, I liked the episode a lot. Uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I'm excited for episode three, but. What did you think of the episode overall? Any more thoughts that you wanted to throw out at us? Things you noticed? Easter eggs? I'm- I I really, really liked it. I thought that it was like a natural next step that didn't feel too rushed. I I think that with this one, I had a lot more time to like sit down and absorb it. Because the first, with Remembrance, like I said, I had a watch party. So a lot of it was kind of stopping and starting and explaining. Because for some people, yes, Picard... Like, Star Trek Picard is a great place to have new people start off, I think. Mm-hmm. But also, there are certain things where they say, well, why do they keep talking about Data? Who's Data? So then I'd pause it and I'd explain who Data was. Or when they're talking about androids, I'd stop and I'd explain what it was, which didn't take me completely out of it. But being able to just sit and experience the whole episode from beginning to end, I feel like it was a lot more meaningful for me. So I'm going to go back, I think, and watch both of the episodes again and see... If just me being by myself, even without my husband, because I explain things to him too, to just like not have to explain anything to anyone and just kind of download all of it, I suppose. Yeah, I am uh, I cannot wait to rewatch it. Hope, I'm hoping to rewatch both of them before Thursday so I can yeah. just have that in context. Maybe watch it right before the episode drops. Anyway, uh, we would love to hear what you thought of the episode. Please tell us what you thought of it on uh, hashtag us, tweet at us. I do all this fun. There's a Facebook page. I'm not on Facebook, but my co-host Barry DeFord manages the Facebook page. Uh, we are on Twitter, which is the best place to reach us, I think, is uh, twitter.com slash polytrex. Uh, that's P-O-L-I-T-R-E-K-S. Tell us what you thought. People have shared since the episode dropped how much they loved it. Some people were like, we didn't like it. Hey, that's good. Tell us that you didn't like it. That's okay. That's fine. As long as you're respectful and not hurting people who like it or being mean to them. You can, you're totally allowed to not like uh, things. I'm not a fan of Star Trek Beyond. I, there, I said it. We made a whole episode about it. But, you know, just be respectful uh, and tell people 
uh, be nice to people be kind to them uh, you can tell me if you want to reach out to me personally and tell me how much you enjoyed uh, my jokes or you if you didn't enjoy my jokes <laughs> just don't tell them to me but if that's what you want to do that's fine too reach out to me on twitter.com slash gutter underscore hero g-u-t-t-e-r underscore h-e-r-o and uh, if you want to get to the blizzard of people that are trying to get to Ali and hope that she will see what you have to say about the episode where can people find you Ali? Oh I would love it I, I try to check my notifications as much as possible so please please either DM me or send me something but on Twitter I can be found primarily at my um, my tag I suppose which is at t trucky. I can also be found by that same tag on Instagram. And if you look up T Trekkie on Facebook, you can find my Facebook page, or you can just type in the 24 year old Trekkie. Uh, that's pretty much all the places that you can find me. But one thing that's interesting that I hope Shashank is okay with me plugging a little bit, but on this coming Friday, and this episode is going to be out before this coming Friday, which is exciting. Mm-hmm. But I am taking part in a nerdy lecture series here in Okinawa on Friday night. And I'm hoping to live stream it. So um, if you want more information about that, you can check out my Twitter page. And I'm really excited and also extremely terrified and hoping I won't make a fool of myself. So, <laughs> Oh, Ali will do great. I will definitely be on that live stream just commenting, just typing so fast on my keyboard. <laughs> like people won't see her screen, just my comments. Yay, Ali, where to go, Ali? That's awesome, Ali. I cannot wait for her to do that. Yes, please check out her Twitter page. And also, we have a bunch of other podcasts. My usual co-host, mm-hmm. uh, who is not on the show, is well. He has a lot of live stuff that he's dealing with. I've talked about that in the previous episode, but he is doing a live version. Uh, speaking of live, uh, called Picard Live, and that's yes. on on Track Geeks, where he goes on. Uh, he does it Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, I believe. Uh, that's live on Facebook and YouTube. But if you cannot listen to him live on the Track Geeks YouTube channel or the Track Geeks Facebook page, you can listen to the audio only version. He's doing his own review and breakdown on. Uh, uh, the Picard Live podcast, which is uh, on the Trek Geeks Network, we have a lot of cool other. We have a lot of other podcasts. We have uh, Trek Rewind. There is uh, oh, <laughs> there's Trek Rewind. There's Trek Geeks. We have uh, Discovering Trek. Just so many. You guys. Five year mission. Podcast, Five year mission. All yes. That stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, and hopefully here sooner than later we'll have uh, our own podcast with me and Ali, which is going to be Woo! crazy. It's called Who Is Trek. Uh, but so many more things to come uh, until episode three, though. This is me bidding you farewell. Live long and prosper and forward to Star Side.